from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. My name is Georgette Dorn, and I'm the head of the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress. It is a great pleasure to welcome this wonderful symposium to the library, and a great honor for the Hispanic Division to uh, have you all here. And especially welcome is Professor Sergei Guzinski, who is an eminent historian. The Hispanic Division is the home of 170, but the library has 170 million items. Of those, 14 million relate to, uh, to Latin America, Spain, and Portugal. The Hispanic Division is also the home of the Handbook of Latin American Studies, which is a scholarly resource to study Latin America. It is also the home of the Archive of Hispanic Literature on tape. We have recorded 750 authors until today, and we're adding 50 of those a year online. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Georgette. Uh, thank you all for coming on this um, dreary Friday afternoon, the last day of March. Um, I'm Ralph Bauer. I'm at the uh, University of Maryland, and I'm currently the uh, convener of the Early Americans Working Group, which is a group of lo uh, local early Americanists who, uh, that co coordinates and organizes events relating to the early Americas. So uh, it is my uh, distinct uh, pleasure to welcome you to the symposium Mestizaje, Hybridity and Cultural Entanglements in Colonial Latin America with a keynote addressed by Sergei Kuczynski. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Georgette Dorn, uh, Antalya Guzman Gonzalez, and the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress, as well as the uh, Hispanic Cultural Society for hosting uh, this event today. Also, I'd like to thank uh, the Kislak Family Foundation for their generous support of uh, this uh, symposium, as well as of our initiatives, the group's initiatives here over uh, the last um, uh, several years. Um, uh, and of course, also I'd like to thank the Early Americas Working Group uh, for uh, uh, helping to co-organize this, uh, this event. Finally, also the University of Maryland at College Park for uh, their administrative support. So we're going to proceed in two different panels today, uh, and then those will be, we'll take a break in between the two panels, and then we'll finally, uh, we'll conclude with our uh, keynote address uh, at the end. So I think, uh, are we all set with the PowerPoint? Set? Great, okay, so I think we'll just stick with the original order then. So uh, our first speaker today in the first panel, which will be dealing with uh, Mesoamerica in the first panel, um, our first speaker will be Joan Bristol, an associate professor of history at uh, George Mason University. Uh, she's the author of numerous articles that have uh, appeared in, in edited collections and such journals as Boletin del Archivo General de la Nación and uh, the Journal of Colonialism and Colonial History, as well as of a monograph entitled Christians, Blasphemers, and Witches, Afro-Mexican Ritual Practice in the 17th Century, which was published by uh, the University of New Mexico Press in 2007. She's now working on a new, uh, a new book about pulque, and I think this presentation is drawn from that um, uh, uh, new project, uh, as her uh, presentation is entitled um, Mix Mixing Pulque and Drinking Coyotes in uh, Colonial Mexico. So, uh, Joan? Um, maybe later for the Q&A. Right. Um, so, okay. <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you, Ralph, for inviting me, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, today I'm going to talk about the way <coughs> that pulque, a fermented beverage, was used as a way to talk about race and especially about indigeneity <coughs> in the colonial period in Mexico in a way that has resonance for the present. Um, and I should say that the remarks are drawn from a chapter that I wrote for an edited volume that I think Marcy wrote the introduction for, um, called um, Substance and Seduction, Ingested Commodities in Colonial Mesoamerica, the Atlantic World, and Beyond, which was edited by um, Catherine Sampek and Stacey Schwarzkopf. So it will be coming out in print. Um, but it's also a work in progress because it is part of a larger book. So pulque is an alcoholic beverage, which is made by fermenting the sap of the maguey plant, which is also called the agave. And here we have a picture. Um, and then is this? Oh, and then this is a, this is a picture of a, a, a tlachiquero, a person who is um, taking the sap from the maguey plant through a gourd, and then the sap will be made into pulque. Um, 
Um, Mesoamericans have been drinking pulque for probably millennia. Um, there's some debate about how old it is. Um, although its popularity has waxed and waned, particularly in the past 100 years or so. Um, pulque is quite perishable, so it usually only lasts for a few days, maybe up to a week after it's finished fermenting. Um, although recently some companies have begun canning it for export. And so we, here we have pulque la lucha, and we'll come back to that. Um, the alcohol level varies, so I think it, it can be as low as 2 to 3 percent alcohol. Um, I looked at public uh, health records from the early, uh, the early 20th century in Mexico City, and there the alcohol content seemed to be like 3 to 4 percent. I think that this can pulque is um, 5 percent alcohol. So probably for as long as people have been talking about pulque, they've been arguing about issues of moderation and abuse. So in the 1540s, um, Friar Toribio de Motolinia said that pulque made indigenous people, quote, violently drunk and accordingly more cruel and bestial. Although he then went on to say, actually, however, if taken with moderation, pulque is wholesome and very nutritious. And this is this contrast you see in a lot of, I have many examples. Um, so you can see here in this quotation, in addition to the issues of moderation and abuse, you can see that Spaniards, as well as indigenous people, saw this as an indigenous product that was consumed by indigenous people, although in fact, like everybody drank it um, in many different settings. Um, this Mota Linea quotation also points to the fact that colonial chroniclers tended to discuss pulque through categories of order and disorder, purity and mixture, and health and vice. So as Mary Douglas and others have explained, these sorts of ideas about purity and pollution are often used to maintain boundaries and reinforce social hierarchies. And this connection between purity and social order is particularly obvious in colonial debates over mixed pulque. So pulque sellers mixed pulque with all kinds of things, um, with fruit, with meat, um, occasionally with peyote, and with herbs, and different kinds of roots. Um, and so for Spanish officials, pure pulque, which they call pulque blanco, or like literally white pulque, um, pulque blanco was tolerable. I mean, sort of more or less tolerable at different times, but overall generally tolerable. But mixing it with anything made it bad in the eyes of Spanish officials. As early as 1529, Spanish officials prohibited the sale of pulque mixed with any other ingredient, and this regulation continued throughout the colonial period. So viceregal decrees of 1535, 1671, and 1792 prohibited yellow pulque, and they called yellow pulque corrupt. Um, and they defined this yellow pulque as having, quote, the root, the raíz that strengthens it, causing drunkenness that is dangerous to health and to good customs, and from which come the crimes, sins, and abominations that we see continually. So these decrees proclaimed that public stands must sell only pulque that was, quote, pure and clean of all confection, mixture, root, or corruption. Um, and the root that they were talking about was palo de timbre. Um, and this is when I, like, I Googled. I Googled palo de timbre. And it, this came up on a culinary website. Um, so, uh, so this is a plant that is still used to speed up fermentation. And according to this culinary website, all different parts of it can be used to speed fermentation and still are used. So it could be the leaves. It could be the branches. So I don't know. When they say raíz or root, I don't know if they're really talking about the root or if the branch maybe was used and it looked like a root. But they're talking about this palo de timbre. Um, so palo de timbre was mentioned in many other texts, including the 1681 Recopilación de Leyes de los Reinos de Indias, the compilation of um, the colonial laws. Um, and the recopilacion warned against the damaging effects of, quote, introducing ingredients to pulque that are noxious to spiritual and temporal health. Um, legislators described the Indian practice of, quote, mixing it with certain roots, boiling water, and lime, which makes it so strong that it makes them, indigenous people, lose their senses. Then, they went on. then being alienated, they commit idolatries, make ceremonies, and Gentile sacrifices. Um, so it's not just that Spanish officials tolerated the consumption of pure or white pulque, but they actually made money from its sale. So they had like you know, skin in the game. Um, in 1668, the crown established the asiento de pulque. They named it administrator to collect pulque taxes. And then in 1763, pulque taxation became the responsibility of the Real Hacienda or the Royal Treasury. So this, this seems somewhat paradoxical. So if collecting tax money was the primary concern of crown and vice regal authorities, why would they ban the sale of mixed pulque, from which they could also make money? So it's not surprising that officials would want to prohibit the sale of pulque with like, things like peyote or maybe other kinds of materials that had obvious pharmacological properties. Um, and in fact, Daniel Nemser, who has written about these issues for the late um, 17th century, 
um, has shown that Spaniards actually thought of pulque that had been mixed with certain materials as fundamentally altered and different from pulque blanco. So he quotes a theologian as using the term transubstantiate to talk about this. So this is a material that's totally different. Um, but we might ask, what's the problem with adding fruit or meat or other, you know, adulterating it in other kinds of ways? So the fact that officials were not profiting from all pulque, but were in fact, in fact trying to discourage the consumption of some pulque, suggests that pulque regulations had to do with concern, concerns that were not strictly financial. So I want to suggest that the reason that Spanish officials prohibited mixed pulque was at least in part because of its mixed nature. So we know very well that Spaniards valued purity of blood. So to ha have high status or to occupy certain um, positions, you had to prove that you had limpieza de sangre, or you know, translated as purity of blood, meaning really that you could prove that you were an old Christian, but it sort of in, in, sort of in fact kind of meant that you could prove you were of European descent. Um, presumably, um, Spaniards also looked for purity in the substances that went into physical bodies. Um, and so my favorite example to describe this conjunction of ideas about pulque and ideas about blood lineage comes in a set of responses to a survey of drinking habits that the viceregal government sent out in 1783. And so there's a survey, what do you drink, what's it made out of, when do you drink it? And so this yielded a great list of alcoholic drinks, you know, saying where these things were drunk and what went into them and this kind of thing. And so most of these recipes were sort of neutrally explanatory. So for example, to make a drink that is called mantequilla, which I, in this period I think would translate literally as lard, I don't know why it's called mantequilla, um, but informants reported that they, quote, mixed aguardientes, which is distilled alcohol, and pulque and sugar or some other sweetener. So this was a mixture, but this is reported in a sort of matter-of-fact way. Um, in this list, a drink called coyote stands out. So coyote was, quote, composed of inferior pulque, dark honey, and palo de timbre, this plant. Um, and putting it in an infusion, it gets stronger, and people drink it, although it's very harmful. And the term is nocivo. The term always, I translated, I think, as noxious at one point, and then I sometimes translated it as harmful. But, but it's, always, uh, it's almost always nocivo. So that's interesting um, you know, that this word is like through the century sort of repeated in relation to this mixed, mixed pulque. Um, so the name of this drink, this, the name coyote, is striking. Um, in the eight, as you, I'm sure, know, in the 18th century, the term coyote was used to describe a person of mixed descent, theoretically one who was three quarters indigenous and one quarter Spanish. Um, so liquid coyote, oh, and okay, I did have a slide, I couldn't remember. So liquid coyotes and human coyotes then were both characterized by mixture. So the description of the beverage coyote as harmful and low grade recalls some contemporary Spanish ideas that castas, or people of mixed racial background, including so-called coyotes, were inferior, dangerous, and disorderly. So in 1763, the Capuchin chronicler Francisco de Ajofrin wrote, um, quote, lobos, cambu cambujos, and coyotes, these are these categories of mixed people, are fierce people of bizarre customs. Um, this is not the only kind of depiction of these, these castas or these mixed people. So I brought, I brought these cast paintings because they show people drinking pulque. So you can sort of see what it might have you know, been like in action. Um, but you can also see that these are, these are paintings of mixed people, but they show this sort of harmonious um, family unit. And then those, those of you to whom I spoke before this note, really, I was like sort of confused because the cast painting that we have on our program today actually doesn't have coyote. So I don't know what, what that means, but we could talk about that. Um, so the connection between lineage, sorry, liquids and lineage is clear in a 1611 Spanish dictionary in which the noun mezcla, or mixture, was defined as, quote, the incorporation of a liquid with another. Um, and its verb form, this dictionary, disclined, me, di, this dictionary defined mezclar, the verb to mix, as meaning, quote, to unite diverse things. Um, and then the example was, quote, to, to mix the lineages when some lineages are mixed up with others that are not of the same calidad or quality. Um, the dictionary went on to say, and we say it is a thing without mixture when it's pure, so purity, mixture, or opposites. Um, calidad, used, the word used in the 1611 dictionary in a general way, meaning sort of quality or type, was also used to indicate social status in the colonial period. So there are several ways to approach these Spanish fears about these mixed drinks. Um, so first, um, these, this kind of, the, these rules and legislation reflect a sort of material solution to fears about mixing. So Spanish officials feared that the mixing of liquids and other ingredients in pulque drinks because the re resulting inebriation could lead to the mixing of bodies and ultimately the mixing of blood, both in terms of like the bloodshed that comes from violence um, and also the mixing of lineages that could, you know, 
um, happen when people had sex with each other and had kids together. Um, so po possibly through pulque-fueled sexual relations. Um, so we see an example of this in the ban of sales of all pulque after the 1692 bread riots in Mexico City. So in this, it, right after these, these riots, officials claimed that the insurrection had been planned in pulquerias, and then they banned pulque briefly. There was like a little bit of a disagreement between the Crown and the viceregal government. Um, and Daniel Nemser, this person I mentioned before, has talked in, at length about this. Um, this is, he wrote an article about this. He said, the study of mixed pulque offered elites a language for talking about race mixing, mestizaje, while simultaneously constitu constituting pulque consumers as a seditious collective subject, a plebe defined like pulque by mixing. So he's talking about this issue in this period. Um, so as Nemser's work indicates, this worry about mixing pulque was also a manifestation of biopower, biopolitics, in the way that Foucault has talked about it. So by claiming to protect colonial residents from the disorderly effects of mixing pulque, the state was trying to control their bodies and their actions. And it was then also another way to sort of perpetuate this discourse as, uh, about mixing as undesirable and corrupting and bad. Um, Spanish officials were not only worried about Spanish identity being adulterated, however, but they were also worried about indigenous identity being adulterated. And we see this like all over the place. So we see this in regular um, decrees prohibiting Spaniards, blacks, and castas, mixed people, from living in indigenous villages. And we also see this in the two republic idea, the idea that um, the colonial world should be split up sort of juridically and also spatially into the República de Indios and the República de Españoles, although it's like only a, a fantasy, it never works. Um, so ideas about pure Indianness and pure pulque and the importance of maintaining the purity of both were linked in crown and viceregal policies limiting the sale of the permitted white pulque to indigenous sellers. Decrees from 1608, 1635, and 1639 restricted licenses for selling pulque to indigenous women. Um, although in practice, Spaniards as well as men of different groups were involved in the trade in Mexico City, certainly by the 18th century, possibly before. Um, religious leaders were specifically worried about Spanish culture polluting indigenous people. Um, in the mid-16th century, the friar Diego Duran condemned mixed pulque, writing, writing, quote, today what is called pulque, made by Spaniards from the black honey and water with the root in it, was never known to the ancients, meaning sort of the Nahua people before contact. He's writing in central Mexico. Um, nor did they know how to concoct it until the blacks and Spaniards invented it. Um, and so this seems to be the recipe for coyote that we see later, much later, 200 years later, in the, 17, in the 1783 text that I talked about earlier. Um, Duran then goes on to describe white pulque as, um, quote, their own native wine, which is lighter and medicinal, meaning Nahua people's native wine, um, and then describes this mixed variant as, quote, diabolical, stinking, black, potent, rough, without flavor or taste. Um, so again, so mixture makes pulque diabolical, while white pulque is both purely indigenous and better and more wholesome, but also kind of rooted in the past. Um, in his 1634 Nahuatl confession manual, Bartolome de Alba addressed indigenous Mexicans directly, I mean, sort of, um, lamenting that, quote, for a gourd of pulque or a cup of wine, you cast your souls to hell and give them to the devil. Um, and he claimed that before contact with Spaniards, Nahua people, quote, had discretion, prudence, fear, shame, and good breeding. But he said that now they had been turned into beasts by drunkenness and intoxication. So he wrote, even though the ancients your elders drank, <clears throat> excuse me, it was with moderation and restraint as your neighbors the Spaniards do today, which I don't really know what to make of that. But, um, and if by some chance they sometimes used to discover some drunkard, they immediately took away his life for it. And now in our times it exists because nobody restrains you with the death penalty. And this is actually in reference to this idea um, that comes from the Florentine Codex that under the Aztecs, the drinking of pulque was restricted to um, ritual specialists and the elderly. <clears throat> Although it seems that this was, this, never really, this was not really the case, but there's this, um, people think that this is the case. Um, so Duran and Alba then were idealizing the past, this Nahua past, um, and using pulque as a way to argue for the need to protect, but really to regulate native bodies. Um, yet in reality, of course, people and practices were actively mixing in all kinds of ways. Um, Friar Ilarione de Bergamo, who was an Italian Capuchin who tra traveled in New Spain in the 1760s, described maguey in this way. So maguey, the plant, right, from which pulque comes. So he says, as you can read, um, this plant is also held in special esteem by the most blessed Virgin Mary, um, because in the year 1540 she appeared <clears throat> to an Indian named Juan de Aguila on the hill of Tototopec, which is not far from Mexico City, and told him that he should look for her image in the very same place. 
After initial efforts, he found in the middle of one of these plants a small statue of the Blessed Virgin with her babe in her arms, though it is not known from what material it is made. The Mexicans show great faith and devotion to this, and in time of greatest need, they have a special recourse to it through public prayers. So what does this sound like? It sounds like the Virgin of Guadalupe, right? So, so um, the Virgin of Guadalupe, just nine years before, had appeared to Juan Diego at Tepeyac, um, and she you know, appears in this hill where Tonantzin was important, this earlier deity. Um, this description also calls to mind Maya Huel, who is the goddess of maguey and pulque, depicted in both the Codex Mendoza and then here I have an image from the Codex Borgia, um, as a woman with 400 breaths nursing a baby while sitting in a maguey plant. And so, you know, this is how it's been interpreted. So. Um, however, pulque was, pragmatic, was, uh, was hybrid in a more pragmatic way as well. So it was hybrid just because lots of people drank it in many different situations. So the same Italian friar wrote, um, today consumption <clears throat> of pulque is so widespread that everyone drinks it. There are public pulquerias, which are like our public wine shops. A few years ago, it was not proper for people with any kind of social standing to go into them because entering a place frequented only by drunks and by rabble of every ilk seemed to undercut their respectability. Now people of every rank frequent them, and during the time of my stay in Mexico, I observed many carriages and coaches of gentlemen, ladies, merchants, and other respectable people heading to these places. And this is my favorite part. As for myself, in the roughly five years that I resided in that country, I could not get used to drinking that liquor because of its foul odor, even though Europeans, after drinking it for two or three days, became even more keen on it than the local population itself. <laughs> so Bergamo here is obviously participating in this sort of discourse that sees Spanish Creoles as sort of degraded because of their American origins. Um, but it's also in interesting because it shows, um, and, and he's saying in this period, but I think it's true, it's definitely true earlier as well, that pulque consumption was, of course, not only limited to indigenous people. However much the discourse about pulque revolved around identifying them as, as the primary pulque drinkers. So ultimately, I'm interested in the way that this colonial pulque discourse may or may not foreshadow ideas about indigeneity and Mexican identity in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. <clears throat> so after 21, I'm sorry, after 1821, caste distinctions and ethnic privileges and protections were abolished by liberal policymakers. After 1910, mixture was celebrated. Um, the idea of the Indian as part of the cosmic race really became a linchpin for Mexican national identity. And the idea here was that the Indian was part of the past while the mestizo was the future. And I should say, going back to the 19th century, Deborah Toner has written this wonderful book um, which I can't remember the name of, but about the, about the representations of alcohol and drunkenness and the relationship to national identity in the 19th century. So that's a very good book. Um, but so the modern, in the modernization products of the early um, to mid 20th century, pulque sort of fell behind. So the state actually encourages beer consumption over pulque consumption. Um, beer was taxed less heavily. There weren't as many hygienic regulations. Um, the state was subsidizing some of the beer producers. Um, and in part, this is because it's seen as sort of modern and progressive and clean. Um, and pulque is characterized as not clean in this period. Um, now in the 21st century, pulque is having a resurgence as middle class students and all kinds of people go to pulquerias, and it's very, very hip. And that's the word that's always used to describe it. Um, so the New York Times and the LA Times have had articles <clears throat> in their travel sections within the past five years or so, <clears throat> um, which emphasize how pulque is sort of a symbol of Mexicanness. So much of the current pulque discourse revolves around defining Mexico through a purely indigenous past. And so here we have, again, pulque la lucha. Um, this is advertised, as you can see it down there in that like ribbon on the bottom. It says, um, it's older than tequila, stronger than beer. It's the original drink of Mexico. And the website uh, go, it claims that the drink, quote, survived the ravages of the European invaders for three centuries prior to the formation of the Republic of Mexico. I mean, I guess none of these things are really not are untrue, you know, but it, um, but it's sort of the way they're using it to advertise. That's interesting. Um, the New York Times describes pulque in one of these travel um, articles as, quote, a thick and pungent 2,000-year-old Aztec drink, even though the Aztecs were not 2,000 years old, um, and, quote, a toast to the Aztec gods. Um, so I'll end by saying that it's tempting to see historical continuities between the colonial and modern idealizations of indigenous identity and the effort to discursively define Indians as pure in both cases. Um, and that was really where my emphasis lay, I think, when I first started thinking about this. Um, but when we examine this more closely, we see a rupture with the colonial past as well. Today's pulque discourse emphasizes the mixed nature of Mexican identity and in many ways relegates its indigenous identity to the past. 
However, throughout the colonial period, indigenous people were a central concern of the Spanish colonial authorities, and one of the ways that Spanish authorities tried to contain indigenous people and their economics, uh, sorry, and their economic activities was specifically through this pulque discourse. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to hold the questions uh, until the uh, end of the panel. So we'll uh, proceed right to the next speaker, uh, who will be Gary Sparks, who is an assistant professor of religious studies at George Mason, Mason University. His research and teaching focus on anthropological, sociocultural, and linguistic, as well as ethno-historical uh, ethno understandings of theological production in the Americas, particularly among indigenous peoples. His areas include histories of Christian thought, the theories of religion and culture, religions of indigenous American peoples, and the religion in Latin America. Since 1995, he has done human rights work uh, uh, with and conducted fieldwork among the Highland Maya in Guatemala and Chiapas in Mexico. His first book, The America's First Theologies, um, Early Sources of Post-Contact Indigenous Religion, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press in August of this year. Uh, he's currently revising his second book, uh, Domingo de Vico, uh, de, de Vico, Quiche Maya Intellectuals in the Teologia Indorum, uh, Recovering the Legacy of the America's First Theology, which is under contract to be published with uh, the University Press of Colorado. Uh, and also he is uh, completing, uh, with the support uh, the, of the NEH, a scholarly translation uh, and critical edition of uh, the Teologia Indorum, which will be published in 2020. His, uh, titled, um, his talk today is entitled uh, Religiously Appropriating Indios, 20th and 16th Century Theological Production from and by, well, Indios. Great, many, many thanks. Uh, the title is supposed to be somewhat of a double entendre, which I hope will become a little more um, clear um, as we proceed. And if you had never heard of the Theologi Andorum before in Ralph's uh, Nice introduction, uh, I'll unpack that um, as well. <clears throat> Based on the use uh, of the term since at least the medieval era and the application, or perhaps better said, the misapplication of indurum to the Americas, it served as a catch-all phrase for all fantastic objects from an exotic land, namely its flora, fauna, and peoples, and by extension, their rights, customs, and laws. Accompanied with the emergence of the Spanish Empire and its ideology of clean or pure blood, the category of Indio was further relegated to a pejorative status socially, politically, as well as theologically. And much of the history is on religion in Latin America by focusing on records of the Auto de Fe's tell of early missionaries' preoccupation for the endurance of indigenous religions as forms of idolatry, witchcraft, or heresy especially when seen as mixed with Christianity and thus akin to a spiritual mestizaje. As a result, many cultural theories, even those sympathetic to native peoples like post-colonialism, tend to relegate indigenous people to the options of a simple binary of only being either overly romanticized reactionary resistors or passive victims who are simply coerced into a new religion. Thus, ironically, such binary options limit and undervalue the agency and reasoning of indigenous peoples, both historically and presently. And yet, on the other hand, the early paper trail written in indigenous languages by both missionaries and early indigenous peoples also drew from, um, oh, excuse me, evinces a more complex engagement of where native peoples and mendicant missionaries also drew from the worldviews of the proverbial other to reconfigure, if not also translate and maintain their own. Now, among the earliest of these documents, of course, uh, written by the Highland Maya in particular, in Kichain languages, is the Popol Vuh, which serves for Mayanists and indigenous activists as a cornerstone within a larger body of early Native American literature. However, the references to Christianity have remained a perennial puzzle leading some scholars to argue that the Maya authors were resisting either Spanish Christendom at large or the specific practices of missionaries in general, such as preaching or doctrinal teaching. And most of this confusion lies in the opening lines. The dates of the Popol Vuh, if you're not familiar, redaction dates are 1554 to 1558. 
In the first line of the Popol Vuh, the Quiche authors state that their text is, quote, the root of the ancient word, the Ochertzich, only to then juxtapose their ancient word with what they refer to a few lines later as the talk about God, Uchapas Dios. In this way, the Quiche authors use uh, Christianity and the missionaries, quote unquote, talk about God as a foil against which to reassert a pre-contact by a cosmology. However, the specific phrase, Uchapas Dios, was not coined by the Quiche redactors of the Popol Vuh, but rather they lifted it from among the writings of a Dominican friar, specifically Domingo de Vico. In other words, rather than merely referring to Christianity in general in this opening preamble of the Popol Vuh, by this phrase, the authors of the Popol Vuh indicate that they have read and are responding directly to the first theology written in the Americas, Vico's Theologia in Durum. Of the early mendicant missionaries, Domingo de Vico compiled the first important works on numerous Mayan languages after arriving into the Americas in 1544 with over 40 other Dominican missionaries and Bartolomé de las Casas. Within a short time, Vico is said to have learned no less than seven different Mayan languages. And one year prior to his death in 1555, he completed his Theologia in Durum, a theology for the Indians or theology of the Indians. Consisting of almost 1,000 manuscript pages, uh, divided into 218 chapters across two distinct volumes, Vico's Theologia in Durum addresses a variety of theological, moral, and cultural issues. And while no first generation or even complete manuscript has survived, I've positively identified uh, now 17 partial versions in at least three, if not five, different Highland Maya languages, which allow for a complete reconstruction of the full text. This is simply a chart of uh, the size of those manuscripts are more or less where they reside, mostly in Paris and Princeton. As one of the first generations of Spanish students to study at the University of Salamanca, after the arrival or return of Francisco de Victoria and the establishment of Thomistic scholasticism alongside humanism as the curricular standard, Aquinas' Summa Theologia serves as both the general organizing structure of Vico's Theologia Durum, but also the analogical method by which Vico strove to reconcile Catholicism with the Maya worldview, much like Aquinas had centuries prior but with Jewish and Muslim Aristotelianism. In this compendium genre of a summa, Vico presented narrative summaries of biblical characters in a style akin to the hagiographic stories of the popular golden legend. For example, volume one, which Vico finished in 1553, begins with the Thomistic themes of the names and being of God and continues with stories and lessons of the Catholic Old Testament while integrating elements of Highland Maya religious material. The second volume, finished in early 1554, presents narratives of the New Testament and incorporates uh, standard but much more detailed than usual catechism material, particularly at a time when catechisms were becoming much more simplistic because indigenous peoples were deemed as rudimentary, rudes, who just needed to memorize the rudimentary material of doctrine. In contrast, the contemporaneous mendicant, to other contemporaneous mendicant texts, Vico's Theologia in Durum distinguishes itself in four important ways. First, Vico's theology is not a translation of a previously written work elaborated in Europe and then exported and translated into Mesoamerica, but rather explicitly references Maya rituals and narratives based on his own direct conversation with and ethnographic study among the Maya. Secondly, the Theologia in Durum is never, in fact, ever written, let alone translated into Latin or Castilian Spanish, but was originally composed in Quiche. Thirdly, the Theologia in Durum is the first known work written in either North or South America to explicitly declare itself a theology, thus intentionally distinguishing itself in terms of genre from its textual peers. And finally, I think perhaps most importantly, uh, while apparently commissioned as an aid for priests, the primary readers directly addressed in Vico's texts are not fellow clergy, but rather literate Maya, to whom he refers as ish, you all, and numi'al nukahor, my daughters and my sons, by which the Theologia Durum then emerges as a direct Christian reply to the Maya and their cosmogonic narratives 
found in texts like the Popol Vuh. Now, while Vico's obvious aim pertains to the conversion of the Maya to Catholicism, his strategy builds off an affirmation of pre-Hispanic Maya religion. In chapter 25, he argued against the autonomous mixing of Maya religious practices with Catholic devotionalism, but he does not rule out altogether a mixing of Catholic theology and indigenous devotional practices. Furthermore, he wrote not only in the Quechean languages, in which he makes his argument and assumes a literate Maya readership, but also used the high register of Maya ceremonial discourse typified by elaborate poetic parallelisms and archaic turns of phrases, which are traceable to ancient glyphic texts. A prominent example of this is the phrase which means literally yellowness, greenness, but is more or less a couplet, a lexical parallelism for wealth. And we find these actually in the hieroglyphic texts of the classic period. Just as notably, Vico selected motifs and phrases from Maya theogony also found in the Popol Vuh. He chose the Maya term for the other world, Shibalba, to mean hell, and he employed a Maya metaphorical language of weaving and sewing that we see in the beginning of the Popol Vuh for his narrative of the cosmogenesis, rather than, say, use uh, that of the biblical book, uh, which is more language of pottery and smith making, metal smithing. And he selected terms for his god, like Tzachor Bitor, the maker and the modeler, and Alom Kachalom, the bearer and the begetter, over other phrases also found in Maya Theogony, such as the sovereign plume serpent or heart of earth, heart of sky. And he even refers to his Christian God explicitly as our mother and our father, thus modifying the doctrine of God the Father as the first person or persona of the triune deity. Now, in addition to the Popol Vuh, beginning in the early 1550s, most certainly 1552, Highland Maya began to write numerous other documents in their own languages and exclusively for their own purposes. So not for the crown, not for the audiencia, not under editorial control of clergy, but in the mendicant script or alphabet and employing the Iberian legal genres, many of which show further influence of both the Theologian Durham and the Popol Vuh. The title of Totanikapan is arguably the third most important Quechean text, and the first seven folios, 14 pages, consist of a redaction of key chapters directly from the first volume of the Theologian Durum, and even lists and cites the specific chapter numbers used, beginning with chapter 30 and the story of Genesis in the opening line of this titolo. However, within their autonomous appropriation of the Theologian Durum, the title of Totonikapan further contextualized or corrected Vico's theology by, for example, specifying that Cain was killed in his milpa, his abish, and that Moses confronts a burning boysenberry bush, a tukan, a boundary, a shrub that's used as a boundary marker, even to this day among Highland Maya to distinguish property lines, details not in the Theologian Durum. Furthermore, by the eighth folio of the title of Totonikapan, the authors of that text begin to integrate myths also found in the Popol Vuh as if to reconcile the pre-Hispanic Maya religious narratives with the biblical material presented by Vico and equating, for example, the mythical Mesoamerican city of Tulan with the biblical city of Babylon. Now, curiously, in contrast with earlier Quiche writings of 1554, like the Popol Vuh and the title of Totonicapan, which dates most certainly to 1554, that is to say, both of these texts are written one year after Vico finished the first volume of his Theologian Durum, 1553. Later, independent Quiche writings actually mention Vico and his Theologia by name. For example, the third title of the Tamup, which dates to 1598, also argues that the legendary mythological Maya ancestors made of maize by the divine grandmother, Shmukane, according to the Popol Vuh, are direct descendants of the prophets and patriarchs listed in the Catholic Old Testament, as the title of Totonacapan did. Thus, via this supposed land deed, the Quiche Maya argued for the validity of their pre-Hispanic religious narratives, ritual practices, and authority by not resisting Hispano-Catholicism, like the authors of the Popol Vuh did, but rather by grafting onto it. Furthermore, this Tamup titolo explicitly cites, if you notice the last line I've cited there, Vico's Telegian Durum as its source, which you didn't see because I didn't advance the slide. Case in point. <laughs> 
Um, now, unfortunately, the Highland Maya paper trail thins out after the 1600s. And while there is no evidence that clergy outside of the Guatemalan Highlands, say other Dominicans further north in Oaxaca, were ever aware of Vico's theology even there, local references to him, say in Guatemala, and his work in ecclesial accounts uh, seemed to peter out uh, by the 19th century. However, as recently as uh, by the mid-1960s, both Catholic and Protestant clergy concerned with social issues, uh, issues of social justice in areas with predominantly indigenous populations like southern Mexico and the Andean region began to reevaluate the role and value of culture in large part due to the influence of indigenous activists. While clergy and theologians such as some Dominicans, Jesuits and Marinols, but also some Presbyterians, Methodists and Lutherans began to elaborate a what's called a theology of enculturation alongside a theology of liberation even prior to the Second Vatican Council, the 1960s, by the 1970s, indigenous activists within various Christian denominations began to produce their own strands of enculturated or indigenized Christian theology. Through various uh, international, regional, and highly local workshops, aided by sympathetic clergy and bishops often, indigenous activists helped establish an informal network of centers, curricula, and publications that argue for ways that indigenous religious worldviews can constructively engage Christian thought and practice. For example, for various Highland Maya of Chiapas in Guatemala, the wives of Maya men ordained as deacons in the Catholic Church also serve as unofficial deaconesses in accord with the cosmogonic principle of gender complementarity. I should be very delicate on this matter because it, w it was an incident that was investigated uh, by then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger in the Diocese of San Cristobal de las Casas. Just, if this is public, uh, it didn't happen. Um, the, and the liturgical and hagiographic church calendars are integrated in many parishes with the 260-day Mesoamerican ritual calendar. Clergy, in many cases Jesuits, uh, often don't wear habits or even the Roman collar, but rather the attire of traditional Maya elders and villages. The Eucharist I've seen celebrated on a platter or patent in the shape of the back of a turtle, therefore referencing the fertile surface of the earth, as well as the constellation belt of Orion from which Hunapush Belanque emerge with the resurrected father as the god of maize. Um, and in certain services, scripture readings are often paired with, accompanied by readings from the Popol Vuh, translated into other local Mayan languages, such as Tzotzil, Tatal, Lanjobal, thus aligning the quote-unquote word of the Lord with the Maya ancient word, Ojertzif. As a liberationist theological movement, but in the hands of modern indigenous intellectuals, they struggled for a name that would not separate them from the class analysis of liberation theology or the cultural attentiveness of enculturation theology, but simultaneously would indicate that their approach was distinctively indigenous and one shared in common across the Americas, across distinct indigenous languages, worldviews, and even national histories of oppression unique to native peoples. In the end, the term that they thought best indicated their unique condition of oppression, historical perspectives and cultural resources from which to respond as indigenous peoples um, that all native peoples in the Americas shared was the category Indios. And so they've begun a twofold effort of one reappropriating and redefining on their terms a pejorative category, arguably much like Criollos did with the term mestizo in the 19th century for the ideology of la raza, to elaborate a distinctively but hemispherically teologia india. And two, to begin to specify and move beyond the category of indio for the elaboration of particular theologies of distinct peoples like a particular Maya theology, or even more specific, a Quiche theology, a Chol theology, a Canjobal theology, Tzotzil theology, etc. What has been proposed here is not that there is any direct link between Vico's Theologia and Durum, the writings of Highland Maya elites in the 16th century, and the current efforts by indigenous peoples to develop Christian understandings on their own cultural and spiritual terms in the movement they call Teologia India. In fact, I find it quite ironic that I can literally count on my hand, actually a couple of fingers, the number of uh, academic uh, Latin Americans involved in Teologia India who even know who Vico is or was, and neither of them have actually read anything by Vico because they don't know Quiche. 
Any explicit textual dots to connect between the 1550s and the 1970s is too vague and spread thin. So any legacy of Vico lies not in the written record of later clergy or Maya, but rather at best implicitly in the local traditions of how Maya leaders continued to navigate between their indigenous and their Christian understandings. But at the very least, a thicker ethno-historical context based on intertextual analysis of the wider corpus of Quechean writings by both mendicants and Maya provides a diachronic lens through which to read current trends in Latin American religion and thus further reevaluate the continued agency and intellect of, well, Indios. Thank you, Gary. Our uh, third speaker will be Ajab Dutino, who is a professor of history and international affairs, as well as the director of the Americas Initiative at Georgetown University, where he focuses on the history of Mexico in the context of the Americas and the world, in particular, uh, the history of popular communities as they engaged colonial rule and early capitalism, national states, and industrial challenges, uh, as well as revolutionary promises and national developments. He's the author of many journal articles, book chapters, and books, including From Insurrection to Revolution in Mexico, Social Bases of Agrarian Violence, 1750 to 1940. It was published by Princeton University Press in 1986. Making a New World, Founding Capitalism in the, in the Bajillo in Spanish and North America, published by Duke University Press in 2011. And The Mexican Heartland, How Communities Shaped Capitalism, a Nation, and World History, 1500 to 2000, published by Princeton uh, this year. Uh, the title of his talk today is An Old Regime and a New Economy, a Dynamic Balance in Spanish Mesoamerica. Thank you, Ralph, for the invitation and for organizing, and to Georgette for hosting us all. Um, I come as an enormous admirer of Serge Grushinsky, um, from his early essays um, to the Man God's book, to the Colonization de lo Imaginario, to the Eagle and the Dragon. I can just say I have learned so much, and more important, always been set to new ways of thinking. Um, early on, he and I focused, I want to say, in different ways, but on social cultural encounters in the Mesoamerican core. More recently, we both turned um, to Spain's empire and its global role, again, in different ways. And I want to say exactly as it should be, how dull life would be if we were all doing things in the same way. Asked to speak today, I quickly came to two goals. First, I wanted to build on one of the concepts I most admire in Serge's work, um, the notion of hybridity. And second, I wanted to take the chance to offer a preview and gain some feedback on some of my work in progress. Um, as I thought about it, because when asked for a title, you come up with what you think of it the day you're invited, um, in certain ways, um, Better title for what I want to do today might be simply called A Hybrid Political Economy, Spanish Mesoamerica from 1550 to 1800. And this comes out of the fact that I am in the process of completing two things. In fact, while the Mexican Heartland book has a 2017 date on it, I am these, you've given me a break from reading the copy edited manuscript <laughs> today, so I want to thank you all for that too. It will not be out until um, November, and because I have the copy edited manuscript in front of me, if you straighten me out on something pivotal, I still have time to <laughs> tinker. Um, and I simultaneously have just finished what hopefully is the last draft of a manuscript, I had to get it done before the copy edits came, of a book entitled Mexico City, 1808, which I tell people is the book no one will believe Tutino wrote, because it is urban, political, and short. 
Um, and I have never fallen into any of those traps before. But I'm trying and I have succeeded. It's going to publish to less than 200 pages of readable text. So I count it a triumph. Um, the Mexican Heartland book very much um, focuses on the rural communities of the basins around Mexico City precisely to distinguish it from the Bajio that I wrote about in Making a New World. The Mexico City book focuses on a pivotal moment of regime change. From what, and this is really what I'm going to focus on today, from a regime that ruled primarily by mediation backed by claims of divine sovereignty to a, a lesser regime, and I want to call it more a state, that ruled by military assertion backed by claims of popular sovereignty. And I'm not going to get into the transition today other than to say one of the things the book tries to do is point out that the shift came in 1808 before the wars of independence. The turn is part of the stimulus to the conflicts. It is not a result of the conflicts. That's not for today. What I want to emphasize today is that both projects, the Mexican Heartland Project and the Mexico City 1808 Project, required me to push forward on a rethinking of the nature of the Spanish regime in New Spain over the long haul and particularly prior to 1760 in the coming of the Bourbon assertions, and thus to rethink the impact of what we too often we call the Bourbon reforms that hit New Spain hardest from the 1760s. And my emphasis there is that that impact was far more limited than we have often taken it to be. But today I want to focus on my emerging understanding of the regime of more or less 1550 to 1750 and its pivotal role in sustaining and stabilizing a silver economy that funded Spain's empire, that drove global trades, and focusing on it in what I have dubbed the Mexican heartland, a region grounded in enduring, self-governing, landed indigenous communities. My argument, and in the original title, is that it is an old regime sustaining, promoting a new economy. I use old regime very explicitly as the English variant of what Europeans would call an enchant regime. an enchant regime tied to an economy becoming ever more capitalist, and that the fusion of them is what matters. And I'm going to argue that both the enchant regime as it evolved in New Spain was a hybrid, the new economy as it evolved in the Mesoamerican regions was a hybrid, and thus the fusion is a double hybrid. Let me try to make the case. And you'll quickly see that I am building upon and giving my own twist to a lot of work by colleagues I admire. Um, so on the Enchant regime, following the work of Alejandro Cañeque, following Ernesto Sanchez de Tagle, whose work is mostly known in Mexico, following the work of Annie Glamperieri, and also following the work of my colleague Jim Collins, who has argued for decades that what is called absolutism in France and Europe is over understood as coercive and needs to be seen in very different, more negotiating, mediating ways. I see the regime that emerged in New Spain 
after about 1550 as a classic Anshan regime in key ways. It is based on multiple corporations and institutions, sanctioned, with multiple rights and laws, integrated and overseen by a regime that focuses on mediation. Sometimes judicial, sometimes political, but everything is a balancing act. And it does that, and you can play with the cause and effect, because certainly in the interior of New Spain, it is a regime with notably limited coercive capacities. It has very little ability to force anybody to do anything. And thus, it turns to force only as a last resort. And it understands that. If everything I've said to that fits the model of the scholars I have listed, I think, in terms of being an Anshan regime in the New World. But I want to emphasize, in New Spain, it is very much a hybrid, because it was grounded in the creation of literally thousands. One good Mexican scholar has counted over 4,000. Um, indigenous republics with rights to land and self-rule built on the remnants of the indigenous Altepetl, ruled by native notables, adapting variants of what I just generically call indigenous Christianities. I don't think very far from where Gary is going here. And that operate with sanctioned rights to mediations through special courts. What perhaps, this I offer speculatively, made this hybrid a particularly unique variant of an Anshan regime is what is really the extreme dearth of military power on the ground in New Spain. If, as my colleague Jim Collins has detailed, the French Anshan regime mediated first and coerced only when pressed when it had to, there was no dearth of coercive force in Europe. War guaranteed that there were coercive forces around and available. Sometimes one wonders a little more dispersed than we sometimes think. In New Spain, after 1550 in the Mesoamerican regions, after 1600 and the end of what are called the Chichimeca Wars in the Bajio and regions north, the indigenous majority was disarmed. That's famously known. Less often recognized is the Spanish regime, essentially disarmed too, and relied on what I at best can call minimal and uncertain militias, certainly not controlled, funded, or commanded by anybody in the regime. Now again, there were military efforts, but the Spanish Empire's military activity focused first on the naval protection of trade and on holding, in New Spain, the far northern frontiers. And I will quickly note that in the latter, its success was pretty limited, too. Um, it didn't have all that much effective force in the far north as well. So if I'm right, the question becomes, how could a regime with such limited coercive powers be sustained for centuries? And I want to argue there are really two key factors lurking behind this. The first is, I don't know how else to put it, the greatest calamity of contact and conquest was, became the basis for the underlying success of the regime that followed, and that is the depopulation. That by the late 16th century, resources are astonishingly ample to a radically shrunken, surviving native populations organized in the new 
indigenous republics. And also to Europeans who are building commercial estates, other commercial activities. It is in that context that Woodrow Bora, Brian Owensby have documented for the 16th and 17th century, William Taylor for the 18th century, that overwhelmingly indigenous, in, indigenous republic to indigenous republic relations and conflicts, indigenous republic and Spanish officials, merchant conflicts, were mediated in the courts. And the ability of the courts to mediate legitimated the continuity of the regime. So the depopulation creates an environment, a, a true rarity, I would say, in modern history, in which resources are scarce for almost no one for a period of time, and the regime consolidates in that context. Simultaneously, and the intersection may be even more rare historically, the opportunity of silver from the 1550s created possibility of profits for merchant financiers, for mine operators, for commercial estate growers, and no shortage of resources to do it, but also we sometimes don't recognize enough opportunities to market produce and gain wage income for indigenous peoples inside and outside the indigenous republics. And in that context, the society of Spanish Mesoamerica is integrated by an ancien regime that used negotiated processes of petition and mediation to balance interests among the powerful and used the courts to mediate disputes among indigenous communities between indigenous communities and estates and merchants, etc. All backed by exceptionally limited and uncertain militias. I have almost gotten, it is so regular for scholars, students, to just, it's a, it's a language that comes to all of us so naturally. The Spanish forced, the Spanish coerced, the Spanish made it happen. And I say, wait a minute, tell me, they may have ordered, they may have mandated, but find me the coercive power. Where is it in the neighborhood that that happened? And I haven't gotten many answers that it's actually there. Something else is going on. And I'm searching for a way to understand it. All right, that hybrid enchant regime, my argument is, sustain an economy I increasingly describe as silver capitalism by the 18th century. And in Mesoamerica, I want to emphasize, particularly in the core basins around Mexico City, my Mexican heartland, that silver capitalism was also a hybrid. Finance, commerce concentrated in the capital, in the city, as did the wealthy families leading mining landed entrepreneurs. They're concentrated in oligarchy as capitalist as any in the world in the 18th century. The distinction in the Bajio in the regions north, the subject of my making a new world, zones with few landed self-governing native republics. Commercial capitalist ways, the new economy, shaped life all the way to the base, top to bottom. From the 17th century through the 18th. Mine workers, tenant growers, wage workers in fields and factories, including the thousands of women in the great tobacco factories of Mexico City and Querétaro, live in a commercial I think rapidly becoming capitalist society. But in the Mexican heartland, the Mesoamerican heartland at this point, outside the city and mining towns, the vast majority of the population, 90% live in indigenous republics speaking indigenous languages, Nahuatl or Otomi in most cases, through to the end of the 18th century. 
while their populations had been low and lands were ample, late 16th through the 17th century, people of the republics had basically had the capacity to sustain themselves and to take wage supplements, market earnings, at mines and estates providing for the city. After 1700, population begins to grow. Land becomes less sufficient, but not radically scarce, um, in the republics. And it becomes less possible for families and communities to maintain the autonomous production of sustenance that had marked them post-depopulation through the 17th century. But in the 18th century, as um, Spanish entrepreneurs took over the commercial production of indigenous crops, indigenous crops maize and pulque, were primarily produced by indigenous community-based growers through the 17th century. From about the 1720s, major landed entrepreneurs based in Mexico City took over production of commercial production of maize and pulque. They took over the Mexico City pulquerias. Um, and they create, while well, they profit wonderfully, their capitalist utopia, they offer increasing amounts of wage labor at their estates to sustain families and communities. So people are capable, are able, and they do remain residents, vecinos, citizens of the indigenous republics. They produce sustenance to the extent they can, but as they can't, they increasingly tap the income of the commercial economy through some marketing, but ever more through wage labor. And in the process, it sustains the republics and their families. And in fact, through the 18th century, subsidizes and sustains a growing commercial silver capitalism. They're actually essential to its endurance and profitability. Simple characterization of a complex problem. Production of silver, the international trade, the internal commercial economy, and regime revenues all grew more than four times over in the Mesoamerican regions of New Spain from 1700 to 1800, while the population little more than doubled. And what is too often not recognized, in the Mesoamerican heartland, stability held past 1800. There is no major destabilizing challenge to this regime until 1808, 1810. The break, I argue, came in 1808. It came in May in Spain. It came July to September in Mexico City. When in the reverberations that came from Napoleon's invasion, politics were militarized in Spain and in New Spain. And the militarization of politics came coupled with claims of popular sovereignty. And I will simply say that has set me to thinking a lot about a rethinking of the 19th and 20th century. But that's a new and different history, and I'm just going to say thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, we're running a little bit late, um, but maybe we'll have, uh, we'll just take a couple of questions and then uh, go to a, a very short break and then continue with the second panel uh, after about a five minute break. So, um, are there any questions or? Please. Uh, I have uh, three questions. First question for you, and uh, I was very interested by the parallel between uh, mixed race and mixed food. Just, it's about Bartolome de Alba. You, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and I would like perhaps if you, if you could comment more because he's a mestizo yes. 
talking about right. this subject. Yeah. The second question is for you, Gary. The, the link between the theology, theology of liberation and this theology of enculturation in the Maya of And John, last question. Uh, what's the role of a religion and of the lack of secularization in the perpetuation of the Ancien Regime till the beginning of the first years of the 19th century? Do you want to first? Um, well, maybe you can help me think about it. I mean, so I mean, Bartolome de Alba was a mestizo, and he was right. I mean, I, he was writing this, he wrote this confession manual for. He was a priest, I think. Yeah, he was a priest, yeah. He, and he wrote a confession manual to be used among the Nahuatl speaking people. Um, so I guess he was, I think he was really talking, the way, the, my interest in him, I guess, is the way that he's sort of distinguishing between the Nawa people of the past and the present, he's not really talking about mixing. Um, so, so he, I mean, so you're saying because he himself is, is mixed, and sort of what does that mean? Um, for us. Yeah, for, yeah. At least for us. Yes. Um, I don't think he considered himself as a mystic. Uh huh. So you're, so you're saying, so what, so he considered himself as, a, as a Nawa or as, as a, a priest? As a priest, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, so you tell me, so what do you think the implications are? No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was very interested because. Yeah, yeah. With Bartolome, Bartolome de Alba, yeah. he's a priest. Yes. That he's also a mestizo. Yes. And he's a brother of Ixiltochi. Yes, yes. Supposed yes. to be uh, uh, Indian or and Spaniard. Uh -huh. But ju just the fact of these people talking about this topic yeah. and having all this problem of defining themselves. Right, right, right. Or not defining themselves. Uh -huh. All right, I have well, no answer. Yeah, yeah, I don't have an eye <laughs> But, but that's a, that is a good way. I mean, that's very interesting. I think I sort of, because also the way he sort of functions in my paper is he sort of tacked on to this discussion of mixing, but then really he's saying something different. So I think I need to think about the connection really between those two parts more. So unfortunately, I don't really have an answer either, but it's a very instructive question. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. No, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I can't really address it further. So um, the relationship between liberation theology and culturation yeah. theology, particularly in in, um, in New Spain or Latin America, um, turn it on. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a great question because there is oftentimes I think a, a false understanding that uh, there's these three movements within uh, current Latin American Christian theology uh, initiated uh, after Vatican II liberation theology. And then there's this uh, conservative reaction against it, which is Catholic renewal of charismatic theology, which comes about a bit later in, uh, in the 1980s. Um, and then an offshoot from liberation theology, particularly around 1992, and, and the counter protest to Columbus's uh, anniversary, the 500th anniversary by indigenous people, the emergence of preparation theology. But yet, if we look at the local paper trail, Really, enculturation theology begins uh, prior to the Second Vatican Council in places like Chiapas or Dominicans, mid 1960s. Liberation theology would be much more clear in 1871. Um, and then um, uh, charismatic renewal also begins simultaneous to liberation theology and doesn't acquire a conservative sort of dimension to it until, until late 70s, early 80s. But they're all concurrent relation, uh, movements rather than sort of splintering off the main trunk. The main distinction, though, of liberation theology and acculturation theology is liberation theology is first and foremost concerned with class analysis. So that's the primary sort of locus of oppression that needs to be addressed. Um, indigenous peoples found that they find that rather racist. And so reading early uh, sort of treatise by, say, uh, Leonardo Boff, where they sort of tip a hat to gender oppression or uh, ethnic oppression, for many indigenous peoples, it was once said to me by Ketchi Kelkali, I'm, I'm poor because I'm Maya. I'm not Maya because I'm poor. And therefore, for them, the primary, the sort of the, the superstructure of oppression, to put it in false terms, Marxist terms, is racism. And that the class oppression is really more the, the, the infrastructure. And so they sort of flip it. And they also think that the liberationist theology uh, agenda has a bit more of an assimilationist most of the advocates uh, for liberation theology come out of the liberal political wing of Latin America, which typically wants to sort of assimilate, uh, build in 
which for uh, into mainstream indigenous people, which has a, a tenor of ethnocide for many indigenous activists who are trying to actually preserve some remnant of their, of their culture. So there's, in that sense, they're, they're somewhat shared with the common discourse of oppressed or oppressed, elimination of hierarchies, much more sort of egalitarian horizontal structures as opposed to vertical structures, political, economic, ecclesial. Um, but the ways that they think are the roots of the problem, diagnoses and then prescriptions for that, uh, do seriously vary. I, I don't know if that's the question. No, no. Yeah, okay. yeah, no, sure. Thank you. Um, very easily, um, religion is pivotally central. I could easily make it the third hybridity. If I argue for a regime hybridity and economic hybridity, certainly there is a religious hybridity embedded in all of this. And I'll first escape the question with the highest praise I can think of. It made no sense for me to add that hybridity because that is the issue that Serge Krusinski has addressed in such great depth and detail for New Spain. Um, I don't have much to add there other than to learn from you. But I'll characterize my view of this right now in, in two moments in a pretty broad, overly general way. First, looking at the end of the 16th, early 17th century, the moment in which I see this system sort of consolidating for the first time. And two things come together there that have really struck me. If you look at the communities, almost everybody in the indigenous republics, they're not speaking Spanish, but in the areas certainly anywhere close to Mexico City, everyone is taking Cristiano. They are self-defining themselves as Christian. At the same time, the clerical discourse, shall we say the tired missionary class, is writing about their failure. They have not created Christians in their definitional sense. And to me, that mixes everything. That indigenous peoples have adapted, evolved, and consolidated their vision, their understanding of what Christianity is and should be as it's meaningful to them. Um, they're developing their devotions to virgin saints, the cofradias that sustain them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and at the same time, it is pretty clear there is a resistance to European notions of sin um, and morality. So it is a very much hybridized religion that I have just come, and I use it in the plural, indigenous Christianities. There may be one for every community. This is not a broadly shared reality. And that the whole system had to live by the, the religious hierarchy and the regime learning to accept all of that diverse hybridity at the local level. Um, the, the classic best known example, of course, is we know when devotion to Guadalupe emerges in the regions of Mexico City. It is resisted by the powerful for nearly a century, and there's a point in the mid 17th century where it can't be resisted, so we might as well adopt, promote, etc. And the regime goes forward in that mixed negotiated hybrid way. And then I'll just add, get to the 18th century, and here you have what Bill Taylor showed so clearly in Magistrates of the Sacred. Yes, Bourbon reformers wanted to impose a new, more moralizing, more true Christianity on the communities. And what he found were letter after letter written by those priests saying, if I do that, they won't pay my fees. If I do that, they'll run me out of town. I cannot do that. I have to accept the Christianity that is, that is theirs. That's my short tale of the third hybridity, but it is very much a hybrid too. Okay, maybe one more question. Okay, please. Does the hybridization of the religion in the 20th century impact the Indian community as it uh, strives to you know, adapt their agricultural technology in Guatemala? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Sorry. Does the hybridization of religion in the Indian community impact the efforts on the part of the Indian community 
to move towards a new agriculture. Um, I don't. I don't think so. Um, I mean, I just say I, I'm. I'm. I'm reticent to sort of buy into anything distinctively hybrid about the Christianity in, uh, say, Mesoamerica or Guatemala, given the fact we put a, a Yule tree around the Roman Saturnalia festival of Christmas and look for Easter eggs on the fertility mm -hmm. festival of Easter. I mean, Christianity is kind of hybridity all, all, the, all the way down, right? It's turtles all the way down in that sense. So I'm not entirely convinced Maya have ever really been doing anything different than, say, Celts in, in Ireland, um, or even Palestinians for the past 2,000 years, uh, Palestinian Christian. Um, but no, I mean, I think you can look at things like, uh, I mean, it's probably not as, as interesting as the text is, uh, I read it with the Manchu, where she talks about her father working with the Peace Corps in order to uh, implement new sort of farming techniques, and yet she's trying to harvest uh, a particular uh, distinctively indigenous identity with about 13 of her chapters beginning with uh, epigraphs of the Popol Vuh. Um, and so I think for, a, for many of them, I think they're negotiating a, a, you know, both modern technology, modernity today, just as they were negotiating modernity with Cofadillas and uh, Audiencia uh, 500 years ago. Um, and many of the, the uh, particularly say 1950s, 1960s, um, authors that are bringing in, sort of agents that are bringing in modern technology, Mary Mill Priest are also bringing in the Russian theology, right? So you think Bill Woods, cardamom production, Ishkan, um, and yet sort of what's happening with also Jesuits uh, in, in that area with the culturation theology. Um, and now, of course, Guatemala is one of the larger producers of, and exporters of cardamom, particularly from the Ishkan. Um, and a very politicized, liberationist oriented set of five cooperatives um, very active with Jesuits um, in sort of a bio Christian identity that might mean. Um, so I don't think they see them anyways as mutually exclusive um, necessarily. Are you, is there a particular counter well, example? I'm thinking the fact that in, in the 60s, uh, the indigenous community, a lot of different indigenous community, I know, uh, began to look at the use of fertilizer in a different way. Uh, and I think that was a part of their ability to see fertilizer from a different vantage point in terms of what was happening in religion, in terms of evolving religion. Because at one time, it was very difficult to get them to change their survival agricultural pattern. I think that also has to do with a local sort of political tension, particularly in that period of the introduction of uh, Catholic action, yeah. um, and trying to break the, the sort of the political Absolutely. stronghold of, of the cofradías, which would see themselves as traditional, even though you know they're yeah. traditional since uh, the 1550s, 15, uh, 1580s. Um, so I think in some ways that's much more of a political um, tension between those principalities that have worked the boys up to the civic religious hierarchy and those that are more trying to look for a more merit-based um, way of um, socioeconomic access and, and power and circumvent that. Um, it gets couched in religious discourse, but I think it's much more of a political. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.